Welcome to lecture 11. We've been talking about information theory, and then we've moved on to inference, and we're discussing, in a moment, different ways of doing probabilistic modeling. I want to remind you where, where the website for the course is, and the website for the free book, and just to tell you a little bit about where we're going now. We're in the next lecture, we're going to start talking about Monte Carlo methods. And here's a little encyclopedia of interesting Monte Carlo methods that we will go through. And that's actually going to be chopped into two lectures, lectures 12 and 13. And as a motivation for being interested in those Monte Carlo methods, I'm going to talk to today about clustering as an example of an inference problem. I'll give other motivations as well. You don't have to have a lecture on clustering to motivate Monte Carlo methods, but if I just gave you it as an abstract concept, it might feel a little dry. So we'll talk about clustering today. And clustering can be thought of as an inference problem, a lot like the inference problem we studied in the last lecture, where we said, I've got some decays, I want to know what the exponential is, what's the length scale. So this was an inference problem with one parameter and we solved that with a probabilistic approach, a Bayesian approach. We also asked a second question, what if we think these decays might come from a mixture of two exponentials? And we treated that as an inference problem also, and we did exhaustive enumeration of all the hypotheses that could account for the data. We made a stack of pancakes, with each pancake being a set of hypotheses about what the two exponential lengths were, and all the different pancakes had different assignments of the points to the two exponentials. I made a slip last time. I didn't mention that for the computer demo I did. I actually changed the rules of the game a little bit. I, I, my computer demo had the window going not from 1 to 20, but from 0 to infinity. So I essentially didn't have a window. So that's just to correct the record. Of course, we can make computer programs that can handle the finite window case as well. So now we're about to discuss clustering, and I want to kick off with a little exercise, which is an information theory, a noisy channel question. And it goes like this. We've got a channel with an input that you could set to one or two, and then what comes out of the channel is a real number, y, and the probability distribution of y is Gaussian around either mean one or mean two, depending which input you put in. So this is a noisy channel, and if you want to know about the capacity of such a channel, you can read the book, but today we're just going to ask a, a simple question, which is, you use this channel, the prior probabilities of the two possible values of x are pi one and pi two, the channel is used once, out pops y, what is the posterior probability that x was 1? So please work out the probability that x equals 1 as a function of y. And I'd like it in the form of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus something. Have a chat to your neighbor. Okay, so how do we solve inference problems? We write down Bayes' theorem. That's not controversial. The posterior probability of x given y is the probability y given x times the prior probability of x having that value divided by the sum over all the two possible values for x. And when you rearrange that into the form of 1 over 1 plus e to the minus a of y, where a is my name for everything that you get there, a of y is, I could write it out longhand, here's the longhand version,
So the pi 1 and the pi 1 and pi 2 have got slurped up as an additive log of a pi ratio, and the uh, 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squares have all cancelled out, so we didn't, don't need those. We just have a difference of two squares is the interesting y-dependent bit. And if you want to be elegant, you can remember how differences of two squares work. Um, a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. And that gets you to an elegant way of writing this. That looks from SAP. So A as a function of Y is some sort of linear function like this, or a linear function like this, depending on the sign of uh, the multiplier we've got here. The way I drew M1 and M2, M1 is smaller than M2, so it actually looks like this. This is A Y. And A is a measure of how much the hypothesis x equals 1 is the winner relative to the alternative that x equals 2. So it's a winner to the left, and it's a loser to the right, unsurprisingly. So just redrawing these two humps. The posterior probability that x is 1 given y looks something like this. like that. That's what you get when you put a straight line through the 1 over 1 plus e to the minus blah function. And this is the place where the two probability densities are equal. Um, and I've offset this a little bit so that 50-50 is here. And why is it offset? Well, because pi 1 and pi 2 might not be equal to each other. If pi 1 and pi 2 were both equal, if it were 50-50, probability, then this sigmoidy thing would go through half at exactly this uh, midpoint here. Having pi 1 not equal to pi 2 uh, adds an additive constant that slides this thing to the right. Okay, any questions about this? So if I tell you I'm going to use this channel, then the output of the channel, y, is a real number whose probability distribution is a mixture of two Gaussians. That's what P of Y looks like. Or depending on pi 1 and pi 2, it might look like that. Okay, that's what it looked like if pi 1 and pi 2 were So why do we care about mixtures of Gaussians? Well, we might be working on channels, and the channel might have an output that has a Gaussian distribution, and we, you might be interested in understanding that channel. Alternatively, we could be talking about clustering, and one way of thinking about clustering <laughs> is many clustering al algorithms actually correspond to inferences of where the Gaussians are, assuming that the data does come from a mixture of Gaussians. So that's what we're going to play with now. I'm going to show you some clustering algorithms, and we'll see how they actually correspond to inferences to do with mixtures of Gaussians. So here's some real data just to remind you what we might actually be talking about if we were doing real clustering. These are um, frequency time plots of speech, so if you're a sound spectrum evolving in time. It's got a beautiful structure with this sort of fine-grained comb structure. Those are harmonics of the fundamental that the voice is producing. And there's this great gloopy movement of power going to and fro as you change which vowel you're producing. And when you go, you get a great broad spectrum. So you can render speech as a picture, and then you want to recognize um, which picture goes with which. Um, that's what babies do when they, they learn, um, when, when they pick up language, they're basically listening to these utterances coming out and they start spotting that things look the same as each other and they discover the clusters that we keep on using the same words over and over. 
So I'm going to show you an algorithm called k-means clustering. And the word k stands for the number k, the number of means you've got. So it's a bit of a silly name. <laughs> it's like calling calculus differentiation with respect to x. <laughs> um, so let's get ourselves a window. That's a good one. Okay. So let me show you the k-means algorithm. Okay, here's how it works. The setup here is we assume we've got some data, and the data is real valued. And as an example, maybe we're making an automatic vegetable sorting facility. And so I'm now going to use x1 and x2 to be some of the real numbers that are coming in. It's a change of notation from a moment ago. So what we measure is x1 and x2 and maybe a whole bunch of other dimensions. And these are measurements made by our automated vegetable measuring machinery. So maybe x1 is reflectance at 600 nanometers. And maybe x2 is ellipticity of the vegetable, and we might have mass and various other things. And so there'll be carrots and there'll be potatoes um, in different clusters. And we want to automatically discover the clusters and, as each vegetable comes along, say which cluster we think it's in. So here's how the K means algorithm attacks this problem. We take all the data we've seen so far, which lives in x1, x2 space, and we plop down into this world two objects, or k, k objects, sorry. I'm going to draw two. Shown by these red blobs. And we call these means. I'll call them mean one. I mean to. And initially, you just slap them down anywhere you like. So we have an initialization step where we plop down two means. So we initialize k means m k, with k going from 1 to k at random. That's step one. Step two is we assign each of these data points x n to the nearest me m. And when I say assign, what I mean by assignment is as follows. We define a distance that measures how close you are. And the distance here is going to be half um, m k minus x n squared. So I'm going to use a quadratic distance. And that's the distance between m k and x n, if you like, would be a long, long name for what we're doing here. So we assign each point to the thing that it's nearest to, and that means that if we drop perpendicular through that, whoops, wasn't intended to exactly hit a data point, um, then all of these points are closest to Mr. 2, and all of these are closest to B number 1 as it happens. Another way of saying what's happened when we've assigned them is we could 
introduce things called responsibilities. And we can define how responsible the kth mean is for the nth point by saying, well, if that nth point is closest to me, then I'm responsible for it, and I get a 1 for the responsibility, and otherwise I get 0 responsibility. So I'm not saying anything new here, I'm just giving you a new piece of notation the responsibility. And it's 1 if mk is the closest mean to xn is 0 otherwise. Or to put it yet another way, Responsibility is 1 if k minimizes with respect to k d m k x m. Say k prime, so I'm not being too confusing. All right, so that's the second step. We assign everyone. Let's go ahead and do this on the screen with an example. So I'll grab some data. Here's some points shown in green. And let's press a and slide this button. And now we slap in some means. How many do we want? I'll slap in two. So we plop them in at random. And one of them is colored orange and one of them is colored green in circles. And then we assign the points. We say, who are you closest to? And I've now done the assignment check step, and I've shown that by colour. So I've coloured every data point orange if it's closest to Mr. Orange, and green if it's closest to Mr. Green. Step three. We update the means. And the update step works like this. You move the mean number one to the mean of the data points it's responsible for. So, M1, or MK in general, get set to the sum of all of the points that it's responsible for divided by the number of points that it's responsible for. And you can write that as the sum of responsibility nk divided by the sum of all the responsibilities. Okay, and we're summing over all the n data points. Happy? So I'm just telling you the mean gets set to the mean of the things it's responsible for, and that's a way of writing it as a formula. Okay, so lights down again, and let's do it. So we update the mean in orange and the mean in green to be the mean of those two. And I've now done that for you, and then we repeat. So we iterate that algorithm, we go back to two. So go to two and repeat until nothing happens anymore. So what do we do again? We assign is the assignment step. Now we update the means. Okay. And now we repeat. We assign. Plop. And now we update. And now we assign. And we update. And we assign. And we update. We assign, we update, and now nothing is happening anymore because the assignment and updates are stable. We've reached a stable state where the assignments don't change and the update doesn't change anything. Okay, so we do it again. Two means, toss them in at random. Assign, update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update. update. Oh, okay, you've got three clusters. Assign, update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update. So, that's K means clustering, and you can choose four means if you want, and toss in four means at random, and assign, and update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update. So now we've found four clusters in the data, isn't that wonderful? Well, I'm not sure if it is. You can do whatever you want, and something happens. So let's assign four, let's set K to four again. Toss in four means, assign, update, assign, uh, update, sorry, assign. Update, assign, update. Oh, it's found the same four alleged clusters. 
Let's try four again. Plus in the means. Initialize. Assign. Update. Assign. Update. Assign. Update. Assign. Update. Assign. Update. And there it's stabilized. Do it again. Notice that gray orange boundary over there. Bit, bit dodgy, hey? So something you may be starting to feel already is hmm, I'm not sure I like K means. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Toss them in. Assign. Update. Assign. Update. Assign. Update. Assign. Oh, look, it's come up with a different way of resolving those two guys that used to be at the gray red border, which is now the gray blue border. Try again. Four means. Oh, that's yet another answer. So, lots of messages coming through here. You can run k-means, it'll find some clusters for you, it will give you a stable end state, but the end state depends on the random initialization. And maybe some end states happen more often than others, but that doesn't necessarily prove that they're better in any way. Okay. So, that's k-means. Let's switch to a different data set and see if we can make ourselves like k-means even less than we do at the moment. k-means is already quietly, quite a widely used uh, algorithm, incidentally, so it's, it's popular. So let's pick some different data sets. Uh, let's look at this guy. So here's some data I made, which, if you ask a human, they might say, yes, I can see two clusters. So you say, haha, we have a clustering algorithm. So let's run k-means and say that there are two means. Put them in at random. Assign, update, assign, update, assign, update. Hmm. What do we think of that? Not quite what we had in mind, right? Let's, let's try again. Two means. Blop, flip, blop, flip, blop, flip, blop, flip. Aha, we found another answer. But it's still... Green guy has gone and grabbed a few guys which we really wanted to be in the carrot cluster. So we're exploring some defects of this algorithm. It isn't really doing what the human would have done given this data set. Try one more time. Two clusters. Plop, flip, plop, flip, plop, flip, plop, flip. Okay, now this time it's grabbed one from the top, three from the bottom. Put them into green lab. Okay, that's not quite ideal, is it? Um, we can always try using more uh, means. You could say, oh, let's have seven instead. And just throw in seven at random and go assign, update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update. And then you say, oh, yes, wonderful. Oh, is it wonderful? I don't know. Maybe there were only two clusters there, but it's come up with seven because we told it to. And it's still going to put one of them into the yellow cluster <laughs> and at the bottom there, which probably we didn't really want to um, have in yellow. Okay, so K means clearly has some defects, but it's got a sort of elegant beauty and simplicity to it. You just you do stuff and it ends up finding clusters, and that, that has to be useful. So what should we look at next? Let's switch data set one more time. And I'll show you this one. Um, okay. So ask a human how many clusters are there in this data set? Anyone? Two? Any advance on two? And I'll think one. Okay. So off we go. Let's try and find two clusters with K means. Okay, so, oh, we got sort of lucky there, didn't we? Assign, that looks promising. Update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update, assign, update. Beautiful, we've found the two clusters. Okay, well, we can do it again. Two, and it finds another incorrect way. And another. Try again. Oh, so close, so, but it's not stable. So, <laughs> Okay, so it's not giving us the answer we want, but it's not a million miles from what we want. It's got the spirit of uh, a useful clustering algorithm. How can we improve it? Ah, what if you normalize the coordinates? Okay, so what does normalize the coordinates mean? Take the data and stretch it before you give it to the stupid algorithm. All right, so 
You can imagine doing that. They both both of these axes actually roughly go from zero to ten, so it's already roughly normalized. Instead of complying with you and giving you your normalized data, I'll just say, well, I'll switch the data set to one that looks like that, okay? Where that's zero and ten, and that's zero and ten. Okay, now it's normalized, and it's still going to break. <laughs> Maybe not quite as badly as this one broke, but... Let's not hack around with the data. Let's have a different attitude. Instead of saying hack, 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 tweak, tweak, modify the algorithm, let's give it an interpretation. Because actually, it's doing a perfect job of a well-defined probabilistic activity. Namely, if you think of this, dis this distance as being the thing that appears in the e to the minus half in a Gaussian, it's already got a factor of half in it, so it's this thing here. What this algorithm is actually doing is it corresponds to assuming that the data comes from a mixture of k Gaussians. They all have the same variance as each other. So here's the interpretation. We're assuming that there's k Gaussians all with the same variance, and that's the same in all directions. So, it's a spherical Gaussian, if you like. And then, the final assumption is that they all have the same prior probability, pi 1 equals pi 2 equals pi k, and then the algorithm that we're running here is a, a greedy algorithm that is, what's the interpretation? Maybe I'll define precisely what it's doing in, in due course, but it's coming up with a hypothesis about the assignment of the points to those different clusters, and it's then doing the obvious thing with the means, namely setting them to the data means, which is finding a sort of local maximum a posteriori, maximum a posteriori uh, probability interpretation of the data. So k-means is roughly a MAP, maximum a posteriori algorithm uh, that adjusts Um, the assignment variables, which we could call kn, to the hypothesis of which point, which cluster the nth point came from, and adjusts all the m's, so as to maximize the posterior probability. of the assignments and the means. So that's an interpretation of it. And given that interpretation, we can now have some fun, because we can say, well, maybe I don't want to make those assumptions. Maybe I can change them. I, get, I can get myself a new algorithm that will be a better algorithm, because it corresponds to a different set of assumptions that I actually want to make. And maybe we can also not only change these assumptions here, one, two, three, but maybe we can change this algorithm and say, well, I don't actually want to know the most probable hypothesis given the data. Maybe I'm in interested in something a bit more representative of what's probable, what's credible. Because um, even if the data really do come from two identical Gaussians with equal prior probabilities, and you try putting the means in the right places, you say, ha ha. I will put mean 1 here and mean 2 here, which is where they really belong. You then put your divider in, and you allocate all of these guys to class 2, and all of these to class 1. Now what happens when you run the update step? What's the mean of this shaded blob here? Is it in the right place? Is it at mean 2? It gets nudged to the right, right? Because we've lost this tail here, and we've gained an extra tail here of double representation. 
representation. So it'll actually bump over a little bit to the right. So even in the case where all these assumptions are true, the MAP algorithm ends up, because it's very firm about the allocation, it ends up putting the means in the wrong place. So we don't quite like this because MAP isn't quite what we want to be doing. So let's fix all of these things. Let's modify the algorithm. And the next step we're going to take is called the soft k-means algorithm. And we're going to show version 1 of the algorithm. And it starts in the same way by initializing the k-means at random. And we set a stiffness parameter beta to an arbitrary value. Beta is now going to come in when we change our assignment rule. And the assignment rule, instead of being hard, is going to be soft. So we assign like this. We're going to say RNK, the responsibility, is So in contrast to setting k to the minimum, the k that minimizes the distance, we're going to do a soft min. So we're going to do this. e to the minus beta distance from m k to x n divided by the sum over k prime of e to the minus beta distance from m k prime x n. So what are we doing? We're rattling through all the possible k's and saying, okay, how close do you feel by this e to the minus beta d measure? And if you feel like you're the closest of all the means, then you'll end up with the biggest responsibility. But you won't get 1 anymore. You'll get 99% or 83% or something. So it's like this responsibility here but you would obtain ones and zeros only if you set beta to infinity. Make beta would make it very large, then you reproduce the old hard k-means algorithm. Okay, so that's our new definition of the responsibility. And instead of minimizing, what we can say we're doing is soft min. And you might recognize that this looks a lot like what we did in the question at the beginning of this lecture. So it's not a completely arbitrary thing to do, is it? I made the mistake there of wiping out the update rule. The update rule, mean k, is just the same. So there's no change to the update rule. You just weight each point by how responsible you feel for it. So you're softly responsible for all the points and uh, you say what's the mean of all the points I'm responsible for, but you weight them by responsibility. Okay, so if we do that, well, we have to pick a value of beta, so we've sort of made a bit of progress, uh, but we've got a, a new parameter beta in. Um, let's Just try setting it to arbitrary values. So to kick off with, let's take these old data points that we had before. And how many means would you like? Shall we toss in, hmm, we say four? Okay, and we pick a value of beta. And I'm representing beta by the radius of a circle, because one thing you won't have missed, I'm sure, is that with this d here being half of something minus something squared, if you take d and imagine putting a divided by sigma squared here, then it looks a lot like what's on the exponential of a Gaussian. So this beta you can think of as being 1 over a standard deviation. Okay, so that's its meaning in this probabilistic interpretation that we've been working on. 
So I'm showing now four means that I've slapped down at random, and I'm showing you how big beta is by showing you circles centered on each of the means. And now we run the soft algorithm. It goes assign, update, assign, update. So assign. And I'm showing you the color if the assignment is very strongly in favor of one mean. And if it shows a pale blue, that means that the point isn't really sure. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not clear who it's been assigned to. Uh, I've just got a threshold there for the color to kick in. You have to be, I don't know, 70% responsible or something like that. Okay, update. Assign, update. Assign, update. Assign, update. Assign, update. Assign, update. It's, it can be a bit like watching paint dry. Soft algorithm. Sign, update, sign, update, sign, update, update. Okay, what's happened? We put in four means, but now it's decided it only wants two. People could raise their hands and say, oh, hallelujah, we've got an algorithm that automatically discovers how many clusters there are. But I hope you're a bit more skeptical than that. It's just an algorithm, it's doing something, and yes, we gave it four means, and it's only chosen two for this particular value of beta. Uh, we could, um, Try again. Okay, so it's done the same again for that value of beta. But it didn't have to do that because we didn't have to give it that value of beta. Um, oh, what are we doing now? I put in nine clusters by accident. Um, okay, what I was meaning to do was to change different values of beta. Um, so, we go back to the same R crunch again. Okay. So, we'll plus in four means. But now what I'm going to do is run the algorithm for a sequence of different values of beta. So I'll start with big values of beta, and then when it's settled down a bit, I'll just change beta to a smaller value. So, um, I'll, that means I'm starting big beta, uh, I've said it the wrong way around. I'm starting with big standard deviation, so small beta, sorry. Starting with big standard deviation and then gradually reducing the standard deviation every, I don't know how many iterations. Each few iterations, I'll just change the standard deviation so it's smaller, and give things a nudge and, this, and keep on running the algorithm. And I'm not going to press anymore for assigning an update, it's just going to run itself, I think. Oh, I, no, 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 wrong demo. Okay, try again. Um, six, two, run, four, okay. No, it's still not, okay. Quit octave, run up. Off we go. Four means and ah. all right. So that was a very large standard deviation, and they're all converging on one place. So it's saying I at that standard deviation, if you like, I only want one cluster. Right. Off we go. So now we reduce the standard deviation a little bit, and we assign an update and assign an update, and whoop, a couple of them have popped apart now. You keep on reducing the standard deviation, now it's another pair have popped apart, and now it's settled down with four clusters and their reasonably state. And we're going four, smaller and smaller standard deviations now, and it doesn't change things very much. Should we do that again? Okay, so there we have soft k-means, and it's an algorithm, and it's got an interpretation. The interpretation is, we're assuming that there's a mixture of spherical Gaussians, 
that all have the same sigma, but now we're controlling that. The prior probabilities are all the same still, because we haven't introduced any parameters corresponding to different weights of Gaussians. And it's not an MEP algorithm anymore, because we're doing soft assignments, so we fixed this problem here. If we gave it a perfect mixture of two Gaussians, you can check this if you want, it will assign them, and if you get sigma right, if you have the correct value of sigma, then it will assign them in just the right soft way, using that sigmoid function that we found at the beginning of the lecture, and then when you do the mean update, the means will actually end up in the right place. That's assuming that you have the right value of sigma. So that's nice. It at least works on this toy problem. And what we can do as we vary sigma with this soft k-means version 1 is you can run through a sequence of hypotheses of what the standard deviation sigma is and see then what the uh, best setting of the means is. So now it's not an M MAP algorithm anymore maximizing the probability with respect to all of these things. Rather, it's, um, it's actually a maximum marginal um, likelihood algorithm that's just optimizing where the means go, assuming that you've got the right value of sigma. So we're making a bit of progress. We've slightly modified the assumptions. And of course, it's still not going to work well on um, problems of the type we had here. So if you've got the lozenges, you say, I'm going to use soft K means. Um, I'm going to toss in two means. Well, you can see what's happening. It's doing a soft assignment and it's taking forever. It's like watching paint dry. And gradually, it comes up with a stupid answer because we haven't changed the assumption which we wanted to change. Namely, we want to believe that the Gaussians might have different widths in the two directions. Then we'll be able to do Mr. Lozenge. So, what we can do is progress to soft k-means version 2. So, lights on again. Soft k-means algorithm version 2 doesn't just update the means, it also updates the variances. And we're going to redefine what the distance is so that we've got a, a sensible um, D dependence. Um, so we've got a, an axis dependence in there. So I'm going to have a sigma for each dimension. So instead of having a stiffness, theta, we'll have every cluster, sigma k, we'll have for each of these dimensions, which I haven't even given a name to, i, i goes from 1 to the number of dimensions we're living in, capital I. We're going to have sigma variables for each of, of those dimensions, and they're going to be different for every single cluster. So now we're allowing ourselves, in terms of our interpretation, to have Gaussians that might look like this and this. All right, so we toss in um, sigmas, and then we need an update rule that says what we want to do with the sigmas. And so the update rule for soft k means version 2 it's going to say, well, let's look at the variance of all the points I'm responsible for. Using my mean, the value I have at the moment. And we'll do that just on the i-th dimension. And divide by the sum of the number of points I'm responsible for. That's a reasonably sensible looking variance update rule, isn't it? You might say, oh, I want a minus one down here to take account of degrees of freedom or something like that. But I don't think I've got that in my algorithm. Okay, so there's a variance update rule. And we just run the same algorithm with the assignment now being the appropriate modification of this beta D thing so that it's actually got all the different variances in it. So it's E to the um, minus... Um, some overall dimensions, distance squared over the corresponding variance. So there's soft k means version 2, and let's play with it. So 
So what we're going to say is we want axis aligned Gaussians. And incidentally, I'm going to have the pi's changing as well. So um, we'll initialize the pi's to some sort of value. We'll have a bunch of things called pi k, which you can think of as the weights of the Gaussians, how heavy they are. The assignment rule is going to be the same, except we'll cross in pi k's in here. So now we've got a pi dependent algorithm. And the update rule for the pies will be that you look at how many points have been assigned to you. So how many am I responsible for? And you update your weight to say, well, I'm responsible for that fraction then. Thank you very much. All right. So let's do that. Let's do it first with the lozenges data. Yep. That's good. Try again. Two means. Yep. Two means. Yep. Two means. Yep. Two means. Yep. So now it's not looking quite so stupid, is it? Okay, let's try another data. Oh, let, let's try four means just so that we don't feel too complacent. So you give it four means and it goes and finds four clusters now. Give it seven, and okay. And I think it went a bit singular. Maybe put one of the means exactly on a data point or something nasty like that. So still, bad things can happen. Yep. So garbage in, garbage out. You tell it you want four means, it'll find you a hypothesis with four means. But everything that we're doing now does have a firm probabilistic interpretation. Something we're going to discuss in two lectures time is variational methods. And this algorithm here is actually a variational method uh, for uh, fitting, it's also called an EM algorithm, for fitting this hypothesis that there are K axis aligned Gaussians. It's a, a, a very principled algorithm for fitting that hypothesis to the data. So let's change data set. Let's change to little and large. Um, here they are. How many means would you like? Should we start with two? Um, oops, did I do the right thing? Okay, two means. That's cute, isn't it? Oh, try again. So, to get off onto Mr. Orange's cluster, it has to first get very stretched out, and it manages to come up with this completely wrong hypothesis that there's a very wide Gaussian, and then it can go and guzzle them up and become narrow. So, you can imagine having data sets where there is a good hypothesis, but the algorithm doesn't actually find it, because it's basically doing an optimization, and it might be difficult to find the good minimum. Okay, it may have got stuck there, or maybe it was on a saddle and it just took so long and I, I gave up. And you can give it five means, and it comes up with God knows what. Okay, four. So, it's still a sort of arbitrary algorithm, because you can pick any value of k you like, but at least all of the pi's and sigma's and means are now being automatically handled. And I did mention a moment ago when the whole screen suddenly went light blue, uh, a hypothesis for what happened in that case um, was that one of the data points had been completely uh, taken over by a single mean. And then what happens? Well. If we're using this update rule here, if you feel very responsible for a particular point and no one else is responsible, then you'll keep on updating the variance and saying, oh, look, what a small variance I could have for this one point that I'm responsible for. And your mean will be very close to your data point, get closer and closer, and your variance becomes absolutely enormous, and so no one else is ever going to be responsible for this point anymore because you predict it so well. And so your variance blows up and then that's why the screen goes blue, because I don't have anything to prevent variances from uh, going to zero if the algorithm wants that to happen. So this isn't 
the end of the story of clustering. It can do kind of odd things. I'll toss in seven means again and see what happens. The green thing is wandering off this screen, presumably because there's a data point outside the, the window. There. So, given the defect I just described, that it's possible for one mean to go sit on one point and have its variance uh, go to zero, and the whole thing blows up with uh, this infinitely fantastic explanation for that one data point, it's surprisingly a robust algorithm that it, it that sort of defect happens very rarely, and there's a, an enthusiastic community of people out there using soft k-means version 2 for all sorts of data modeling problems. There's a big literature, uh, an algorithm called Autoclass was written about 20 years, which is soft k-means version 2, and it was used on all sorts of problems, and they had a fantastic time discovering automatically clusters in all sorts of data sets, including astronomical data sets, and they made some genuine new discoveries of phenomena that hadn't been uh, noticed before. Okay, so that's soft k-means, and so your question is, in what sense is this an optimization algorithm? Is that the question? Okay, the answer is when we've done the variational methods lecture, then we'll be able to answer the question of what's actually being optimized here. So I'll leave it as a vague thing. There does, it's not at all obvious. I just wrote down an algorithm that does sign update, sign update, sign update. Why should it converge at all? You could imagine such an algorithm going round and round in circles and never settling down on anything. It does actually optimize an objective function, which is called a variational free energy. So it has an objective function, and that objective function has got an interpretation, which will become clear in, in two lectures' time. Are there any other questions about clustering at this point? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what if the data is on a ring or some other type of data that's not well described by a mix of Gaussians. So data on a ring might look like that. And if you say, please cluster that for me, well, that's what you've asked to have done. And if you use soft k-means, the interpretation of what you're doing is you're using k Gaussians that are no longer spherical, they're axis aligned. Um, and they don't have the same sigmas, but they are axis aligned Gaussians, and maybe the weights aren't equal to each other anymore. But that's the interpretation of what you're doing. And it's not surprising if you give data that doesn't look like a mixture of Gaussians that, well, something will happen and you might not be very satisfied with the answer. So you can play with this algorithm. It's very easy to code up, or you can download my version of this from the net. And what will happen with a data set like this is you might get gave it seven clusters, it might pop down seven Gaussians in some way like that. So you will get an answer which is, in some sense, the best way of explaining this data, or one of the best ways of explaining this data, assuming that it is a mixture of seven Gaussians, or however many you pick. The algorithm won't tell you that was a stupid hypothesis, I could have come up with a better model, because that's artificial intelligence, and that's still an open problem to have the universal algorithm that will just look at data and come up with an interesting explanation of it. And it's good to understand soft k-means clustering as a first step to head off towards the, the solution you'd really like, which is an algorithm that can discover low-dimensional explanations for data. That's something we could get to in this course, maybe in lecture 20 or so, to start talking about algorithms for discovering low-dimensional uh, underlying explanations for high-dimensional data. Yeah. Great, so the question is, could you change the metric? So here we've been using e to the minus half a distancey thing, and that motivated the algorithm, if you like. So that, that assumption that it's a Gaussian motivated the metric and gave us this algorithm. And you could pick any distribution you like. So instead of e to the minus blah squared, you could have e to the minus and invent your own shape. 
And then all you're going to need, assuming that this is a parameterized thing with something like a mu lurking around it and maybe something like a sigma lurking in it, you can use that as your assignment step. So you can just plug it in here. And then you're going to need to get for yourself a new update rule, which tells you what to do with your parameters of that new model. Because probably, if you've changed this from being something squared to something else, then this update rule won't be the right update rule anymore for the new parameter. So, yes, you can. And what do people actually do? I'm not that up to date with the clustering community to hear what they're doing, but I can imagine that people might say, oh, yes, I like to use a T distribution instead of Gaussians because I believe in heavy tailed clusters. So you use a T, and then you need the right update rule for updating the parameters of a T distribution. And the T itself is a mixture of Gaussians, all having the same mean but different variances. So that's something that would be fairly easy to write down. And if you read the variational interpretation of this whole thing, that will give you a framework in which you can take any hypothesis you want and then figure out an algorithm that will optimize a variational free energy in just the same way that this does as well. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll discuss Monte Carlo methods using this and some other problems as motivations for why we want Monte Carlo methods. Thanks. <laughs>